crazy wisdom is Chergem Trungpa Rinpoche's word. It's his coinage. Um, uh, I've always used it up to recently. Now we, we use the Tibetan, Yeshi Cholwa, because crazy wisdom is not a translation. It's not a literal translation. Yeshe is primordial wisdom. Ye, primordial she, knowing. Uh, Cholwa means chaos. So there's no crazy in that. So it basically means uh, wisdom chaos or primordial wisdom chaos. The aspect of chaos is that which uh, offends pattern. It offends the pattern of duality, even the religious pattern of duality. So hence, crazy wisdom or yeshi cholwa. Um, now, there's an area of confusion that has arisen even with uh, Tibetan lamas as to the nature of two particular modes of unconventional behavior. One is called Yeshi Cholwa, which is connected with Dzogchen. The other one is Myun Haruka, which Myun is actually crazy. That's, that's the word, and Haruka or Traktung is blood drinker. Uh, Traktung is, is the word used, or Haruka, about wrathful awareness beings. Now, Myun Haruka uh, is shocking. It's different from Yeshi Cholwa. It's shocking because it turns things upside down. And it has a great deal in connection with overcoming the pure, impure dichotomy. So there's a lot of uh, snake and scorpion eating goes on. Uh, you know, the five meats, the five nectars, uh, taking those as actual, perhaps. So there's excrement, pus, urine, feces, whatever. Uh, you know, the five meats, horse, etc., pig, human meat. Uh, these are things that could be eaten. Mostly it's symbolic, but... Um, um, lamas such as Drupa Kunle would be Myun Haruka. They would act outrageously. They would overturn social mores. This is very much Myun Haruka. This is different from Yeshi Cholwa. Yeshi Cholwa does not set out to shock. It, it, it may shock, but it has no intention of shocking. I would say it has more, it's more akin to some kind of Vajra whimsy. So the person simply does not accord with formula in any way. Now that need not be shocking. Uh, I might, uh, fortunately I'm not a crazy wisdom master, I might hold you, uh, pass you an envelope stuff for 50 pound notes and say oh you can have that uh if that might be shocking but it might be pleasurable also um so yeshi cholwa is really something that is um you can't really explain what it is as you can explain what myon haruka is that's quite easy to explain you can look at at lamas such as drukpa kunle you can look at, at Chögyam Trungpa Rinpoche as well and say they conform to that model. But Yeshi Cholwa does not conform to any model at all. And I think particularly it has nothing to do with predictable behavior. So sexually abusing students is not Yeshi Cholwa, uh, primarily because it's predictable that people in positions of power who abuse positions of power what they do is predictable. Now, how is this crazy? This is highly predictable. Uh, financial abuse is highly predictable. So if it's predictable, it's not Yeshi Cholwa. Yeshi Cholwa has to be unpredictable. 
I, I, I always remember Chima Riggs and Brochet in the middle of a, a, a Bardo Turdol empowerment with his uh, bell and Damaru, he's chanting, and he suddenly sniffs his armpit and says, somebody once told me I smelt. Do you think I smell? And then he just continued. I was sitting there and I thought, did I just drift off and have a daydream there or did that actually happen? So I turned to the gentleman next to me and I said, did you? He said, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, he, he'd never done it before. He never did it afterwards. So it wasn't a habit of his to do that. So I always used to describe him as unpredictably unpredictable. He would just come out of left field. Excuse the Americanism, but... Um, he would do things that were just, you just didn't understand them at all. And they weren't particularly shocking. They were just strange, completely. What was that question you once asked you about women, about orgasms? Oh, yes. That was, um, <laughs> I think it was when you were introducing me to him. Yeah. But as your girlfriend. We were, I think yeah. I'd met him before, but we're now in a different relationship. And... Um, he he said to me, "Do women ejaculate? Do you think women ejaculate?" <laughs> and then, obviously, it was complete emptiness experience. He hadn't said anything else to me. <laughs> In fact, I don't think I'd ever he'd ever said anything personally to me before that. Anyway, so I said, "Yes, yes, I think they do." <laughs> and then we just passed into normal conversation after that. Uh, I, I'd never, by. I'd never heard him ever ask anyone a question like that before. It was extraordinary. And then there was a gentleman once who was dying of cancer, and there was this whole. Oh, this was outrageous. Um, there was a whole discussion going on as to whether he was going to die. And some people thought he was going to die; others didn't. And then and this uh, was at a public teaching. A public teaching. Uh, and then he said, I say a jita does not die. And, um, and then he asked me what I thought. And I said, well, uh, a, a jita can't die. Because a jita means deathless, you see. So he was just making a joke. And the whole thing was a joke. But very, I don't think anyone understood it. They just found it bewildering and... Uh, but the interesting thing was that Ajita himself understood the joke. And um, so it was basically for him. And the only way I could understand it in the end was that it was a deeply touching and intimate joke. That it was something to make him smile, you know, that it was a play with his name and that that's what it was all about. But, um, but and I had to take that as sort of a personal teaching to me because at the time I was um, a hospice care nurse. And, uh, I mean, obviously well aware of the fact that you have these conversations about dying and death and that they should be there, but not in a public setting. <laughs> not like that. And I remember talking to you on, on the train yeah. on the way home saying... He can't do things like that. <laughs> <laughs> but that was just my set ideas of how yeah. things... Or it was, it was my perception of the event. I wasn't perceiving it as a personal thing between them. Yeah. You could see him, sm I could see him smiling at the back because he, he knew it was a joke and that um, he didn't have much time left to find anything funny. But so that was... Yeah. The, he, he appreciated the humour of it. Mm. Yeah. So. And it, it was also an example of how he did want people to speak their minds because he asked you, didn't mm. he, what you thought. and You said that he can't die. And then he asked me, and I knew he was going to die. And I knew I, would, I should have said he's going to die. Cause, but I didn't because I couldn't because it was public. And it was, it was one of those situations where I just wanted to cringe and die. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I say, same like him. <laughs> so I can be caught. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, uh, um, 
the next thing, I'm in London, I go to see Jim Rose and Boucher, and I said, well, I, I, I think I ought to tell you that um, you know, Dej and I are, are you know, getting together, you know, but just, just to let you know. But, but we're not telling anybody at the moment. It, it's a secret. It's, uh, only you know this. Right? By the time I get to Cardiff, everybody in Cardiff knows. It, it took that long for him to just broadcast it. So we were sort of used to him doing things like this. And, uh, uh, why it was particularly that he didn't want us having a secret, I have no idea. I, I, I never asked him. But um, it was very funny when we found out. It was somewhat of a relief, too, because we thought, well, we, that's just what's happening. So, um, yes, crazy wisdom. He He, he sort of veered between Myon Haruka and Yeshi Cholwa in, in his manifestations. It's not that you have to book on to use one or the other, but those are the two modes, and they get confused with each other. And um, one lama who understands this is Tuku Dakpa Rinpoche, and he, was, uh, he, in fact, told Bacho, one of our students, that not many people understand this differentiation and that most people think of it as Myon Haruka, the, the shocking behavior. But, but you know, yet neither are called crazy wisdom. That's sort of a split between them. The crazy belongs to the Myon Haruka, not to the Yeshi Cholwa, the Dzogchen mode. That's simply primordial wisdom, chaos. And the chaos is not that you create chaos, but simply that it doesn't accord to any pattern. It doesn't accord to a religious pattern either. So it doesn't accord to renunciation, that one doesn't necessarily look like a renunciate, um, because that's as much of a fashion as anything else. What's the effect over time of being exposed to that sort of a person? Well, it was only for relatively short periods with Chimarese and Rupeshe. Um It's hard to say, really. Um, when you're involved with something to such a degree that it's, it's, it's your entire life, then it's simply the experience you're having. I wouldn't know what somebody else's experience was. I think it would depend why, why you were doing it. I mean, I, I think that I actively wanted him to mess with me. I think if you're messed with uh, and it's something that you don't want or haven't agreed to in yourself, it's another thing. Uh, the reason I decided to ask him to be my teacher for a period of time, because Kunzang Dojo Rinpoche had told me there'll be a period where we won't see each other for 12 or 13 years. And in that time, you should study with, he, he gave me a list of different lamas, and um, uh, Chimarugs and Rinpoche was one of them. He also mentioned Chagdu Tulku and, and a few other lamas, but it uh, I just so happened that I'd already met Chimarugs and Rinpoche, and I thought, yes, I'd like to study with him. And uh, the reason was because he, we uh, entertained him to dinner. Uh, Kandradesh and I weren't together at that particular point. This was earlier. And um, I, I got in a Chinese meal, and a nice Chinese meal for, for him and his daughter. And um, I also got in some cheese, because I, I, I know he likes cheese. And I, I, uh, part of it, I got Stilton, and I got an entire round of, em uh, of uh, brie, about this large, about that thick. Because I thought, however much anyone likes brie, there'll be some for me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so after the, after lunch, Chimera Rinpoche cut himself off a little piece of brie, at the brie and said, "It's very good." He then picked up the whole round and ate it, all of it. And it was then that I thought, "Oh, you really are going to mess with me, aren't you? <laughs> you're, you're obviously the ideal teacher." So um, it didn't stop there, though. Then we went on to the place in Bristol where. He wanted me to take my slides and give a slideshow. And then he commented comment on the slides. And uh, he got them to melt down the Stilton that I bought as well. So they melted it, and he asked me to go out and buy chilies. 
So I bought a big bag of chilies, and he was dipping them into this stilt and eating these raw chilies. And um, he said, he said, you're trying. I said, I'd rather not, Rinpoche. I, I, I said, uh, they have a really bad effect on me. He said, oh, no, these are very sweet. So I said, uh, you want me to eat one? I said, right. I dipped it in the Stilton. And actually, he was right. Uh, I crunched into it, and it was sweet for uh, a, a minute second, and then it exploded in my mouth. And, oh, God, he laughed. He, he also... Uh, got me a pint of milk immediately and told me to hold it in my mouth and that would cure it. But um, I thought, this is going to be fun. <laughs> He's going to do stuff. But um, somehow um, I decided I was up for that. I, you know, I'd read the stories. I'd read about Marsidas. I'd read this stuff. So, sure. Now, I, I don't think I was up for being abused, but I, I didn't count that as abuse. That that didn't it didn't feel like abuse because he got me the milk and he was concerned about me and uh, and uh, he was also extremely kind to me. He answered my questions. He was very supportive. Um, you know, it, it was a mixed bag. You know? Because he gave me a pair, he gave me his pair of sunglasses, which were incredibly expensive things. You know, these Tibetan glasses. Um, mm-hmm. They're made out of smoky quartz. They're they're basically like this. You know, the joint it, it's a little bit thicker, of course, but they're they're actually polished quartz crystal. And in Tibet, um, um, apparently, Dudra Rinpoche had to pay two horses for a pair of these glasses, and he just gave them to me. Uh, so he, he was like that, as well as getting me to eat raw chili and uh, you know, eating an entire ground of brie. So there was just these mixtures of experiences with him. So it was always um, highly creative and, uh, and a sense of the whole situation was being tested, in a way, and worked with and encouraged in different ways sometimes it was a a wrathful form of encouragement sometimes joyous sometimes peaceful so you know the effect on me was that um i actually say i just grew up you know that um I think a lot of us remain as children for a long time and and not in any nice innocent way just just um, not capable of living properly, you know, not being responsible, not being. Um, I mean, his advice on go to in, on, on going to India when people gave him advice was not how to find the cheapest hotel and make sure you're all right. It was you just land, go into the first hotel, whatever it costs, spend your money, then it's gone. See what happens next. It was always throw yourself at life and see what happens. But you really had to be some kind of um, professional human being to do that. It was an adventure, and he wasn't really interested in anything being cozy. <laughs> so if you wanted to be cozy, you went somewhere else, but he never did that. Yeah, you mentioned Drukpa Kunle. Mm-hmm. Um, um, could you talk a bit about about him? Yeah, Drukpa Kunle was um, very famous in Bhutan, and and much loved in Bhutan. And um, uh, one of the things you find in Bhutan that you don't find in Tibet are symbols of Drupa Kongli. There are penises everywhere, hanging over doors, brightly colored ones with faces on them. They're, um, <sighs> they're just part of life over there. And um, he's highly venerated. Um, and, and this, of course, is you know, shocking behavior. You know, I think that sex with Drukpa Kunli is a little bit like Jimmy Riggs and Rinpoche eating the brie. I don't think there's any big difference there. I mean, we live in a society where sex is a big issue. It, it wasn't a big issue there. You know, it, it's entirely different. It, it has a whole other meaning here. I mean, sexual exploitation wasn't really an issue then. I mean, 
sexuality occurred, but it wasn't an issue. It's an issue now. There's certainly abuse now. There's abuse of power, uh, but... You know, Drupal Kunli didn't have hundreds of students. He didn't have a procurement committee. That's not how it worked. He just wandered around and bumped into people and things occurred. Like Jimmy Riggs and Rupert came to my house and ate an entire round of brie. I see it as being the same story. You know, and um, what what comes out of that extraordinary behavior is um, a sense of being projected into uh, a different dimension of reality where these things occur. These things here are normal. <laughs> and relating to them as it's all part of what's happening is maybe si similar in some ways to being at the theater and you don't know the play. You, you, you don't know what's going to happen. Actually, the funniest play I ever saw was just like that. It was uh, The Real Inspector Hound, that was Tom Stoppard play that was put on at the art school where I was, and I, I was in the audience, and they were performing it. And um, uh, the stage gun didn't go off. And so the, so the man was being shot... And the gun didn't do anything. He said, "Ah, oh, the poison dart," and fell to the floor. And and because I because I'd seen, I, I knew the story. It was just so funny, and I thought they should write to Tom Stoppard because this would have improved the play endlessly. You know, but uh, it was just brilliant, you know. And so there's a sort of a world there. There's a there's a Vajra creation. Vajra theatrics are occurring, and within Vajrayana, which is um, majorly artistic. There are just scenarios, and so Drup Kunli would enter various scenarios, and they weren't all sexual. They, they were different. He would get some old man to chant some really crazy text that he'd just written that was... Uh, but what got the old man realization it wasn't the text, it was his devotion to Drupa Kunli and the fact that he would simply recite a bunch of nonsense for hours on end. And he'd recite it even though his son and daughter were saying, you know, what, what, what on earth is this text you're chanting? You know, this is crazy. Well, he just wouldn't believe it. He just continued. And, um, so that's, that's the power of the story there. Of course, you know, doing whatever your teacher tells you to do in, in this environment is, is, it has become suspect, you know. And I think people have to use their intelligence there and look at what the nature of the relationship is. I mean, I never, there was never one instance where either Chimerick Rinpoche or Kunzang Dojo Rinpoche acted out of self-interest. They never got anything out of it. Well, Jim Rupert did get the entire round of brie, but it didn't break the bank, you know. I, I didn't suffer because of it, you know. Uh, he probably <laughs> suffered more through eating it than I did through losing it. But um, so it's really that, you know, Joppa Connolly had no self-interest. There's one story about him where he's, he's offered all this jewellery, uh, a fantastic wealth of jewellery, and he puts it all on. He accepts it. He, he dances with it, then he gives it all back again and leaves. He said, I enjoyed it, <laughs> and that was it. So he didn't take that offering of money. Um, so there has to be demonstrable lack of self-interest in it. And that comes out in the stories of Drupal Conley. People are confused because, of course, they, they look at someone like Sogyal Lakar and say, what's the difference? Uh, the difference is that the uh, ladies with whom um, Drupal Kunli had sex didn't end up with a therapist. You know, they achieved realization. That's the difference. And uh, nobody had a complaint to make about him. I mean, I know it's very hard to compare somebody long in the past with someone in the present, and there are all those considerations. Um, 
I think one of the differences is cultural uh, in as much as if you lived in Tibet or if you lived in India, there was some expectation that there would be people like this. Um, so it wasn't entirely surprising, and you could either go along with it or not. Um, I think one of the problems now is that um, there's a similarity between rock music culture and Tibetan lamas, and Tibetan lamas can, if they want, manifest that that groupy scene. Um, now, the difference is that groupies are not expecting anything. Groupies are not expecting to be on the next album. They know what's going on. They know why they're there. They're not expecting anything they get or don't get. It's just what happens. Now, in the whole Vajrayana situation, there is an expectation. I'm going to get realization out of this or something. And then when that doesn't happen, and in fact worse happens, and physical abuse occurs, then, then there's incredible confusion that goes on there. I think basically there's a... Um, what's it called? Math. Well, I'm not good at math. An equation it's between how weird it gets and what the good result is. So, the more extraordinary the behavior of the teacher, the more extraordinary the realization has to be. It's concomitant. If that's not there, then one has to question what's happening. So all, all you can do really is look at the stories of Drupal Kunle. You can't go and interview the people. You've only got the story. And, uh, and what the story relates is that these people attained realization. Now, whether that was a big cleanup that occurred later or not, who knows? But no one's going to know anyway. You've only got the story. And the story in itself has to be taken as a teaching that extraordinary behavior, extraordinary result, that's what's in the story. That's the only bit that we can use, really. And that if there's extraordinary behavior and misery, then this is not the Drupal Kundi story. I think that's all, you, all that can be taken out of it. That's not a method, uh, method story. It says, do this and good, and good things will happen. Yeah.